Hello, and welcome to the Insight Myanmar podcast. This is a project that has been a long time in the making, and we are really excited to begin on it. In this first episode, we want to give you a little bit of a teaser preview of what you can expect and also describe a little bit about the podcast itself and what we plan to do. At this point, we've actually interviewed seven people already. We're still getting those podcasts up and running. We hope to have them out soon. And you can expect an interview about once a week after this is what we're going to be aiming for. We're looking to bring authentic voices that would reflect the diversity of the Burma Dhamma experience. These include foreigners who've spent extensive time here, as well as, of course, locals, lays and monastics. It could be young or old, a meditator or teacher, scholars and writers, people across the board that represent a sense of the Dhamma practice in Myanmar, people who have dedicated their lives to Dhamma in different ways and are taking a moment to share the decisions that they've made and the lives that they've led. And I think like me and all of us on the other side of this who have been putting the work together, you'll find some of their stories as inspiring and interesting and thought provoking as we have. So this is something that we are very excited to put into being. We also want to express another part of Myanmar than you often hear in mainstream news. This is not to suggest that those stories in the mainstream news don't have their own importance. And actually, some of the stories we tell here are going to intersect in some ways with the changes now taking place. Although in those stories, they often don't reflect the lived life on the ground and especially the Dhamma life that is important to many meditators and those of us interested in spirituality. Those are some of the topics that we want to explore in this podcast specifically. And just a word about myself and some of the other contributors that are working with me to help bring this out. Some of you may know that over the past several years, our team has put together a guidebook for meditators coming to Myanmar to educate them about some of the history of the Dhamma sites that are here and the different monasteries and teachers. One of the things that we learned in creating this guidebook was that the process from start to finish, from the time that we collected some of this really inspiring and wonderful information about the Dhamma practice here and the process it would take to get that out to readers and to meditators was much longer than we wanted. And so the idea came to us to produce a podcast that would just be a more a lighter, more flexible, more accessible model with the hope that we can have these raw interviews with people in their own voice that could then reach meditators within weeks. Uh, so it's a much faster, more direct way to access some of this information. And that's what we're starting here. Through the work on our guidebook, we also came in touch with extraordinary people that were, would help us with our research or that whose own lives intersected with what we were studying and what we wanted, stories that we wanted to tell meditators. And through this meeting, these are people that we are already in contact with that just have a lot to share and that we feel that their voice and their Dhamma lives that they have led are a great lesson and inspiration for many of us. And we want to provide a platform for exploring some of these ideas and learning about their lives and the shape that their lives have taken in their dedication to the Dhamma practice. And so that is what we want to bring to you. The kinds of conversations we hope to engage in are long form interviews. We're not looking for quick question and answer for uh, sound bites. We're not coming with any agenda. We're hoping to really turn the mic over to our guests to allow them to tell their story of how their Dhamma practice in the Golden Land has informed their life. In any case, for myself, long before I started this podcast project, before I started the guidebook, even before I did this amateur documentary about a Burmese monk, Webu Sayada. The first thing I did was create a blog, and I didn't even know really who my readership was. I didn't really know if there were readers. I just wanted to be able to share these things in Dhamma practice in Myanmar that were impacting my own life and my own understanding with an audience that I thought might also find it interesting. And from the very beginning of that blog, which I think was around 2012 or 2013, it's still active. You can find it out there, uh, burmadhamma.blogspot.com. The reason I mentioned that was the guiding principle for starting the blog was to want to extend the conversation. Those were the words I remember in my mind very clearly. And that relates to all the work that, that I've done since. And it also relates to the reason behind this podcast. 
it's this sense that when you're in Myanmar, you have access to certain kinds of people and experiences and places and stories and knowledge and inspiration that simply you don't get when you're not here. That's very hard to be able to access some of these same learning moments. And the very first blog I ever did and everything I've done thereafter has been from a desire to want to take some of the things that you can only really get by being here. And even once you're here, you need to know where to go and how to speak and who to talk to and how to act culturally and how to act in monastic environments and so many other things that there's a lot of serendipity involved. And one of the things we wanted to do with some of these media projects was to extend that conversation. So people everywhere that don't have the fortune to access these places or even people who come for a shorter amount of time, but are not able to go everywhere and meet everyone, of course, that we're able to extend the conversation to meditators and people interested in Buddhism and spirituality and self-improvement everywhere. And that also relates to what we're doing with this podcast. We want to extend the conversation of these people that we will be interviewing that have led extraordinary lives really centered around a sense of renunciation and a priority on Dhamma practice towards letting go of their defilements and reaching liberation. These are people that really have interesting and inspiring stories to tell, and we want to provide the platform to be able to tell those stories. I referenced the guidebook that we did, and I want to end with reading a couple passages from the introduction of part two of our guidebook that is not yet released. We firmly believe that every reader can and should structure their Dhamma practice as they see fit and decide the extent to which they wish to integrate culturally and through the religion as well as the degree to which they wish to renounce, such as whether to ordain for life, to give up food afternoon, to take the eight precepts, etc. Knowledge is power, and the greater the access to information that this book can provide, the more it facilitates direct engagement and individual agency. We do not suggest to readers what to believe or what form of practice to follow, but rather assume a mature readership that can assess, integrate, and even ignore various pieces of information based on one's own individual interests, lineage, and needs. The belief that there are different ways to follow the Dhamma is reflected in the popular Burmese proverb, Lu Jin Du Tole, Atet Shu Jing Wei. And excuse my rough Burmese accent there. Anyway, what that means is although we are all humans, the breath we take is unique. Essentially, this poetically expresses the notion that everyone is different. In the context of this book, this proverb reminds us that while all humans share the same mind matter structure, and the Buddhist teachings apply equally to one and all. Each meditator comes to the practice with different paramis, aptitudes, and preferences. So although those passages are reference to a guidebook helping meditators to discover which sites to go to and the history of those sites, they're also pertinent in the work that we're doing with this podcast, where we're exploring many individual lives, and these lives are actually very different. They're, they're lived by people. Our interview guests have extraordinarily different and diverse experiences, although the central core is what connects them. The theme that unites all of these media projects, the podcast and the blog and the Meditator's Guidebook, is this sense that we're extending the conversation. And by extending that conversation, the reader, the listener, the meditator, whoever you are, is able to gain greater access to information. And that information has power. That information brings you knowledge, which allows you to make more informed decisions about your own life. While you might hear the interview of someone who has fully renounced and given up everything, and you might not be in a position to do that yourself, there is still the sense of what gradual renunciation can bring, whether it's renunciation of certain addictions or certain behavioral patterns or of actual physical property or other kinds of defilements. So with that in mind, we want to go ahead and bring you a snippet of some of the interviews that we've done. These interviews will be coming out in full form very shortly. We hope once a week we'll be able to provide a full episode. But until then, we have a little teaser here, a little five minutes each of every interview that we've done to give you a taste of what we have planned. We'd like to take this time to thank our generous supporters. We simply could not continue to provide you with this content and information without the wonderful support of generous donors, listeners, and friends just like you. These episodes are fully funded by listeners, and without you, particularly without the meta behind such generosity, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. So we'd like to thank you up front for your continued support. We welcome both one-time donations as well as monthly pledges. Large donations of $100 or more are great, but even $1, $5, $10 is also wonderful. 
Every donation of any size is greatly appreciated. You may give monthly donations at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash insightmyanmar. That's www.patreon.com slash insightmyanmar, one word. Or you may also give one-time donations on PayPal. That's www.paypal.me slash insightmyanmar, one word. If you are in the country of Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to do so. You can message us at burmadama at gmail.com. That's B-U-R-M-A-D-H-A-M-M-A at gmail.com. We now invite you to sit back and enjoy the six conversations that follow. The next guest is Alan Clements. He is an American meditator who first came to Myanmar in 1979 and was a monk for many years after that. He spent extended time with Mahasi Sayada and Sayada Upandita and also held a series of conversations with Aung San Suu Kyi. foreigners from European, Canadian, American com- uh, countries. But most couldn't sustain the intensity of that schedule and the demand of the weather, the food. Uh, by and large, there were no meditation cushions allowed in the meditation hall. What did you sit on then? You sat like the Burmese mm. with a towel or a mat or just learned to sit cross-legged on the wood. There were no mosquito nets. Uh, there were hundreds of dogs that howled every minute the bell went off. Mm. Uh, there was no purified water. Wow. And the food was mostly meat and yeah. oil. Uh, and you were vegetarian before you came. I was a vegetarian until the day I ordained. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and yeah. uh, but So most left. I, was in, I think I was in the Mahasi Center for about a year and a half without any foreigners there. Uh, but we did find that Malaysian Chinese came. Slowly, a few came from Nepal, one or two from Vietnam, but very few from America or Europe or Canada or Australia. So how do you think you were able to put up with so many of those difficulties you describe when others who came weren't able to manage? I just love the spirit of the Burmese people, the people of Burma, not only the Burmese. To be in a culture so driven by dana, generosity, unconditional giving, was in itself awe-inspiring. An impoverished country, terrorized by authoritarian totalitarianism, that they sought after giving as a vocation of their life. Their dignity rode on that wave. That was very empowering for me to see, Mm. one. Uh, I won't go into the details, but I loathed American culture. I don't, I feel grateful that I feel very at two, so to speak, with killing. America is a killing machine. Not to say it's the only country in the world, but I feel grateful that I feel repulsed by violence. Hmm. So there was nothing to go back to. I'd made a lot of money. I'd been in a long-term relationship. It wasn't sex and money. I was well-educated. I read. I painted. It was creative. I Hmm. played music. Right. Okay, I had all the things that people longed for. Hmm. Um, Two. Three, I was in intimate company, if you will, with... The leading Sayadaws at the Mahasi Center. Mahasi Sayado, you know, one of the chief people at the Sixth Great Buddhist Council. Certainly, you know, the Mahasi Yekta is considered the home, if the birthplace of the worldwide uh, mass lay meditation movement. I had access to him in dialogue. I had access to them in behavioral apprenticeship, watching them, how they talk, relate. Share, listen, look. Seda Upandita became one of my closest teachers and friends after Mahasi died when I was in 1982. Right. And uh, these monks at the time, being that I was among the first Westerners, I was told, ever to ordain at the Yekta in modern times, handful of others, they delighted in talking to this young novice. And so we had an endless lineup of translators, and I had unlimited questions about the nature of consciousness and meditation and life, theoretical questions. I'm sure they found me, (laughs) you know, barely tolerable. (laughs) But the delight of that Dhamma dialogue, if you will, was radically inspiring for Mm, me. mm. And I just simply loved the regularity 
of monastic life. Mm -hmm. The idea of meditating uh, a lot, it wasn't ever an issue of a lot. Mm -hmm. I actually enjoyed meditation. And so the last point was, I may not be a quick learner, but I'm a very diligent student, and I listen very carefully. And so I listened to their instructions. I know that I didn't know, and I had great faith and confidence that they did know. And so I put aside my my own opinions and listened carefully to their instructions and mm -hmm. followed them. And they turned out to be very valuable to do that, very valuable approach to meditation. Just set your own mind aside, your own thoughts, your preferences. Be mindful if you need to be mindful of them. But by and large, just surrender and listen and do. And I did that, and the results were remarkable. And so I said, why would I ever want to return to lay life when the results of focusing concentration and effort and mindfulness on the nature of mind leads to this level of insight and joy? I said, forget it. Right. And so those four things were the reasons I stayed. The next guest is Sayale Piadasi. She is a nun from Lithuania who has been in Myanmar since 2013. If I think back, every year was different uh, in some way or another. But say for the first three and a half years, it was only meditation. Uh, only meditation. And 2013 was when you ordained? Yes, okay. I ordained in 2013. And when you say only meditation, how many hours a day are we talking? How many days a month are we talking? Uh, like every day. Every day, maybe eight, ten hours. It was full-on retreats, continuous. Uh, well, say not 365 days, okay, because sometimes things happen. You need to go to hospital or whatever. Uh, but mostly the vast majority of days were only meditation. And I was lucky to have... Uh, good teachers, and I, I, I found I was lucky to find the place where I could get good guidance, and where a teacher would instruct you and question you uh, the way that you couldn't slack in your meditation. I had only for three months. I stayed in a monastery where uh, sometimes I would have interview with a translator, and I didn't like that. So I really preferred to have to have an interview in the language directly with the teacher. So that, that made me to try to learn Burmese, but even now it's enough only to tell a taxist where to go or, you know, these kind of things. But for the meditation interview, I still would need a support from a site if it's in Burmese. So I tried to find an English speaking teacher. So yeah, I was quite lucky. But after three and a half years of intense meditation, really, my body failed. And I think, one thing uh, uh, was the body, the health condition, but it surely was also connected with the mind condition because I also was pushing myself so much, which is quite natural. We come, we want to, we ordain, we want to. And I, I sincerely believe, I still sincerely believe it is possible to make an end of suffering in this very life. So in the beginning, with the, all the enthusiasm, you put so much energy and effort, and you think by the more energy and effort you will put, the, the sooner you will get there. So I was pushing myself a lot. Sometimes my mind would blame the teacher also, because the teacher was trying to help you, actually, and put you also up and help you to, to move further. Uh, but... I had to go back to Europe myself to see that actually it was not teacher who was pushing me. People don't understand really. You know, in Spain, I spent about three three months. I spent not even in a cave, on a rock, in the mountains, and I was so happy just to see that you can live like that. You don't need anything. It's amazing. Nature doesn't do anything to you. You know, you can live so in harmony and so simple. It just brings happiness to the mind. So, you know, the simplicity, the more simple conditions, I think, the, the, the happier the mind can be if, if, of course, you're contented, if you're contented, if you're not, you know. Whatever conditions will be, you will not be contented. Uh, uh, I don't see a purpose of really living in a very rich environment. And, uh, much comfort, you know. We 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 search for for liberation from the suffering because we see the suffering. If we don't have any dukkha and we don't see it, then there is no need to do anything. Um, 
changing the subject a little bit, I'm I'm curious about the experience of um, of of being a nun in a country where um, monks are privileged and where the bhikkhuni or the formal nun order from the time of the Buddha in Myanmar, uh, uh, in contrast to other Buddhist countries, is not as seen as broken and unable to be restarted. And because of this, um, Burmese feel much more merit when they're giving to a monk because they're true sons of the Buddha, whereas nuns are more like um, female spiritual renunciates um, than some formal lineage. Um, so I'm wondering um, what your experience has been like as a nun and with your male monastic contemporaries, foreign foreign monks um, by you, if, if you've seen a difference in, in treatment or experience? Of course. But of course, that's you know unavoidable. And in the beginning, I was really shocked, but because I had no idea. Uh, for me, you know, I had no idea when I became a nun that there is really a difference, you know. And it was very painful in the beginning. Uh, but no choice you have to accept, you know, and because uh, I value the Dharma that I get here, I accept. Now that, that's, it's like this. Nevertheless, I see many changes also here. And just recently I saw some pictures uh, of uh, Indian house. Uh, I don't know whether it's like from embassy or whatever, some Indian, many, many Indian women and men making offering to nuns. Some Paok nuns and from some Don Yanachari, I don't know if you know the like study center uh, nuns. So the brown nuns, pink nuns, they had them all instead of monks, and they made offerings and they were preaching and you know they offered food also. So all all all, but they had nuns instead of monks, and I felt so happy for them. The next conversation is with the Bawa Sayeda. He is a Burmese monk and abbot who has a number of meditation centers and monasteries throughout the country and also expanding into the West. I myself also, I have to accuse many things. My teaching is wrong. My teaching is not Theravada. And I was not obeying the senior monks. Who accused you of this? Some of the lay people, they learned from me in the beginning, but when their children came to meditate with me, the children are more intelligent, so they practice seriously. Mm -hmm. So they became nuns and full-time meditators. They cannot endure. They cannot lose their children. Right. That's why they... They make problems to me, to the center. In my side, I'm helping the people uh, who meditate, not to go in the wrong way, to get success in meditation. But people are thinking highly of themselves, so they are grasping what they understand. They cannot accept the power center because of welcoming everyone to stay in the center. Mm -hmm. For the old and sick people, not much problem. But for the young people, there's problem for their parents. Right. So you had difficulty with the villagers that live next to you. You had difficult with the authorities that didn't want to give you permission for, for what you were doing. And it sounds like you also had difficulties with other Buddhists or monks who didn't accept uh, that even what you were teaching was authentic. So it sounds like you you really had difficulties and challenges coming from every single area from which it could come. Yes. How did you persevere? How did you manage? I cannot stop the sender. I cannot stop teaching because many people are relying on the sender and on my teaching. Because of my teachings, they can endure, they can survive. Because of great benefit, I continue teaching and opening the center. Because of not stopping my job, there are more complaints to the government. What did people complain about? In, 2000, in 2012, one of the government officers Robot to their senior 
the power center is opening illegally and making construction without permit. It is really dangerous. Many people are staying at the center also. That's why it is really dangerous mm. for the politics. Right. Uh, because of that robot, uh, the government decided to close the center. So uh-huh. they, they came to the center. Uh, many officers from different environments, the police or other rights person in township, and also the other rights monks, they meet together at the center. They are trying to close the center, but the monks cannot accept that idea because they know many people in the center have no place to go. So if they close the center and drive them away, they are sure to die right. in the street. I see. So if it happened like this, the monks has responsibility by killing the people. And up next is Ashin Chanda. He is a Bangladeshi monk who ordained in Myanmar last year. When I was 18 and 19 years old, then at every year I I went I went to my mother's graveyard and cry Mm. and shout Mm. and uh, and express my depression Mm. out from out from inside my heart. Mm -hmm. So at that at one day I fell slept at the graveyard. And when I opened my eyes and uh, look others' graveyard, then I began to realize that every human being has to die one day. So if they died and my mother died, then I have also to die one day. That's the first thing I realized, the uh, essence of uh, impermanence. So when I, when, when um, this thing came up, this one, uh, I began to mix with the wrong person, wrong person and wrong environment from that time. And that time also, I began to feel that why there is suffering so much. I was feeling very painful at that time. Actually, emotionally, I was very depressed Mm -hmm. and there was no backup for me. There was no guideline for me Mm -hmm. to support me. Right. I passed. Uh, I passed. Tw- uh, I completed my high schools and second secondary schools, and just shifted to Malaysia. Then I began to work slowly. After after one or two months or six months, might be, um, I have passed my first semester, second semester. But slowly, the pressure was coming. The studies pressure was coming, mm-hmm. and I have to work also for a part time job at that time. So I couldn't handle the both, mm-hmm. but I promised my father. But I, what me and my father had a dealing that um, we will just um, you just pay for my study experiences, and I will bear the living costs. Right. So I just uh, I but that didn't go for a long time. So I was very, I I just I was feeling more depressed and more painful mm-hmm. with a co- competitive in a competitive society. Which make me, uh, which I t- where I took decision that I will just um, stop my study and just work. Right. So I uh, my, I told my father and my father was told me to come to Myanmar to work. Uh huh. So from that I from Malaysia I went back to Bangladesh uh-huh. and cancelled the citizenship, and then uh, went to come to Myanmar here. Mm-hmm. And with my father, uh, my father supported me to. Uh, gather the, all the documents and proper documents and everything else mm-hmm. was uh, finished, and I get my citizenship legally I see. here. Right. So, uh, my father, my father's dream and my father's plan was that I will be uh, a set. I will settle up a good business in Rakhine State and mm. everything else in Myanmar. I will have a good family, like ordinary mm. person. Mm-hmm. But uh, the thing is that uh, you need to uh, have you need to have time when you when you go to a foreign country then you need to have you need to take time for yourself to adapt the culture culture things right so i couldn't i was i could i was very impatient at the time mm-hmm. actually i want to do very fast i want to be become successful very fast mm. as i have no backups so uh, my as my father lived with my uh, lived with my uh, lived with his second family i was very i, I was very lonely at the time in Rakhine State. So I told my father that I couldn't work. 
Mm-hmm. Even though in NGO I earn um, uh, earn a huge amount of money, but it couldn't satisfy my mind actually. Mm. It couldn't satisfy my my, my pain mm-hmm. from inside. Right. I told my father that I want to go back to Malaysia mm-hmm. for studies, for study or or work. After that, um, uh, at the meantime, he he just um, said he just agreed with me, but to wait. In the meantime, uh, when I see the monks and nuns in Myanmar, I began to feel peace. The the way and the solution I was finding to solve my own pain and stress and depression, this is the way. Had you encountered monks and nuns before? Uh, twice in Bangladesh. Right. Twice in Bangladesh for temporary. Uh huh. But when I came here and just saw the monks and nuns are very different from Bangladesh. How so? And their their uh, talking and behavior are very different from Bangladesh. So I feel very peaceful. Hmm. Then I began to decide slowly that I want to become a monk forever. But the time was not perfect. I think so. The next conversation is with Sebastien Le Normand. He is a French meditator who has been to Myanmar several times. He's taken his own personal pilgrimages as well as taken extended meditation time at various monasteries. Can I mention that, you know, the first time I was here, it was also because you were my guide? Yes, yes, <laughs> so, you can. <laughs> Everything that, is allowed on here. <laughs> So you could have a say around that then, but um, I mean, maybe you would remember, but uh, for me, as I mean, you know, as we know that that whole practice is around karma. And so there are signs basically in life that way. And I would say that uh, there were a few times when we got to some places and you were like, well, I'm not sure if, you know, this doesn't really happen usually, or this is rare, but you know, it, it might, let's ask, or let's say, and, and if it's, uh, and then we go to that place and, you know, like, Oh, that's the day that actually, they, oh, usually they don't take the Buddha relics out, but then actually today the person is there and then, uh, he, um, yeah, he's, he's willing to, to take them out, uh, you know, for you to meditate or under the Buddha relics or something like that. So, and then, um, you know, we went to IMC and then, um, International Meditation yes, Center where we say, I we can talk. Yeah. Going to teacher. Beforehand, I had already a feeling that it would be an important thing for me to be there, uh, because I've, feel my own special connection to back in to also beyond, beyond the going Kashi. And um, there was this old man who you said was actually one of the few left who had actually studied with uh, Sayaji back in. And he also felt uh, like proposing us to open the pagoda and to get inside and, and see uh, the center of it, which usually is, doesn't happen too often. So, so different. Um, events like that, synchronicities that, again, are karmic signs in some ways. But exactly because of where I was at already on the path with that awareness from my own past karma, there were actually somewhat things that I secretly expected. Mm. And I was like, if this happens, that would be a really good sign and confirmation. Mm. So there was that one thing about IMC because of that connection um, to Ubakin that I have. And so the fact that we got a lot to get inside the pagoda and see the center uh, cell where Ubakin was, uh, for me, was very, very strong. And again, it's just a sense of emphasizing, reinforcing the whole thing. Another thing exactly in the same line, because it uh, has to do with Sayaji Ubakin, was that Back then, uh, the first time I saw a picture of Webu Sayado, I felt also a very strong connection to Webu. And I always thought that I uh, wished I could go to Winjin Bin and to his monastery, both in Xiaose, where in a cave that he meditated, and then at his kuti in, a, in his monastery. Next is Ashin Sarna. He is a monk from the Czech Republic who has been in Myanmar about a decade and is fluent in Burmese and also teaches meditation and does translation. Why this issue is, I guess, what I'm curious about. Of all the things out there, why is this something you find so so important and critical? If monks buy something, nobody else can uh, use it. 
And if monks buy monasteries and lands, then nobody can enter, no other, no monk can enter the monastery. Mm -hmm. And uh, then how do you want to call this, you know, a Buddhist community, you know, like they basically split. And that's why, uh, that's why I said that they are worse than Devarata because the Devarata split the community. He said like, these are my monks. Uh, and uh, he played himself as a Buddha. Uh, and It, to me, it seems like that, you know, because these monks basically by buying their things, uh, they split uh, the Sangha, you know, they, they split the community into the monks who touch money and buy things and the monks who don't touch money and who follow the rules. And uh, having the two two communities like this, uh, it's very difficult because they do not um, uh, cooperate, you know, like the monks who follow the rules, they do not want to do Uh, the recitation of rules with the others. They do not go, uh, they don't want to go for donations, for offerings with the other monks. I went with a monk, you know, from Pao tradition around a monastery where monks touch money. And we are just like 200 meters far from it, you know, like we never visited it. They never told us anything. And the monk just says, hey, these monks, they touch money. Mm. That's so bad, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> like what? They didn't do anything. Mm. So uh, you can see how much they are split it. And that's so, so distressing. That should not happen, you know, in the Buddhist mm -hmm. teachings. So uh, this is uh, a big problem. Monks, unfortunately, both of the, of the both groups look the same way and behave pretty much the same way. They wear the same clothes, of course. They wear the same yeah. clothes. They, <laughs> they have the same the hairstyles, same yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so then people, when they see these monks who touch money, you know, as they're waiting on bus station and collecting money for their monastery into, into their hands and asking people, you need to give us money, otherwise this is not right. And uh, monks who are renting their monastery or who buy a land and then they rent it for shops and mm -hmm. monks who enjoy with ladies, you know, who have babies and so on. Uh, then when people know about these, they think, aha, monks are like this. Mm -hmm. They don't think like monks who touch money are like this. No, they never think like that. They think monks are like this. And then they lose faith. Then they do not study uh, the Buddha's teachings. They do not meditate. They do not work mm -hmm. on their path. And in Myanmar, if you're not Buddhist, then well, <laughs> then it's, it's, uh, you're basically empty, you know, because you don't have any direction. It's, it's like me, you know, before I learned Buddhism. Right, right. So you find it's degrading the whole possibility of the teach of the Buddhist teachings on the promise of liberation. That's right. Mm. That's right. Right. So I would like to to like uh, make it clear that monks who are doing this are, uh, are not doing it right, and that lay people can support them in this. If the lay people don't give any money into the hands of the monks, they will not have them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can. Uh, so there is a way how lay people can support this, and that's why this uh, can be well supported in Facebook, where is the audience complete? Mm -hmm. So my First, uh, I didn't know that monks will be so much interested in my teaching. I thought, like, monks certainly don't care because I'm a foreigner. I haven't been here uh, as a monk for longer than like eight years, so uh, certainly they will never care. But it turned out that uh, they do care mm. a lot. Mm. So, uh, so mainly my teaching was for lay people. I taught lay people, hey, lay people, do not offer monk, uh, money into the monk's hands. Wait until he has kapya. If he doesn't have a kapya, if he doesn't have a steward assistant, then uh, you need to get a phone number of his donor and speak with his donor, but never give money to his hands. You have been listening to the Insight Myanmar podcast. We invite you to rate, review, and share our podcast as every little bit helps. You can also subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Additionally, you can listen and download right off the web at www.insightmyanmar.captivate.fm. That's www.insightmyanmar, one word, dot captivate, C-A-P-T-I-V-A-T-E dot F-M. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure that it can be offered there in the future. Make a post, suggest a guest, request specific questions, or join in our discussions on the Insight Myanmar podcast Facebook group and also welcome to follow our Facebook and Instagram accounts by the same name. If you're not on Facebook, you can also message us directly at burmadhamma at gmail.com. That's B-U-R-M-A-D-H-A-M-M-A -M -M -A at gmail.com. 
Or if you'd like to start up a discussion group on another platform, let us know and we can share that forum here. We would also like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, especially our two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Tharng A, along with Zach Hessler, content collaborator and part-time co-host. We'd also like to thank everyone who assisted us in bringing the guests who have made up the show thus far, as well as the guests themselves for agreeing to come and share. Finally, we are immensely grateful for the donors who made this entire thing possible in the first place. We also remind our listeners that the opinions expressed by our guests are their own and not necessarily reflective of the host or other podcast contributors. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give monthly donations at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Insight Myanmar, one word, or one-time donations on PayPal at www.paypal.me slash Insight Myanmar. If you are in the country and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to do so. Mm-hmm.